Gwent is not a peer-to-peer -peer game. It has a dedicated server. Uh, with that, uh, there is a custom, um, custom server management uh, tool that allows us to, um, to investigate what's, uh, what's going on with the servers, what's, uh, uh, what's the availability, and uh, to, uh, to do some, uh, some scaling. And with regards to uh, different, um, um, the, the rest of the, um, uh, of the components that were used in the architecture, we had the uh, connection manager, uh, which uh, was the, the point of, uh, um, uh, the point where, where the client connected to, which uh, later on was, uh, was routed internally to our different, uh, different services. Uh, so we have the, small lightweight component in front of uh, all, the our, uh, all the other applications. Uh, so we had, uh, of course, matchmaking, and this uh, matchmaking is uh, asynchronous uh, ticketing system. So the connection manager puts the uh, ticket inside the database, uh, the, the, inside the matchmaking database, and um, when, the, uh, when the matchmaking is done, it returns the match ticket to the connection manager and the connection is made, the client gets the, um, gets the URL to, to the server to connect to. So, um, uh, so that, was, uh, that was the part that uh, required, uh, required some um, microservices uh, that, are no, that are known in the um, web development understanding. And besides, we had a lot of different backend services. So we had DEC, uh, DEC being the collection of uh, Gwent cards that the player has, um, user profile, of course, uh, some store for purchasing, uh, uh, for purchasing uh, stuff for real money, in-game uh, currency uh, exchange, and so on and so on. So of course, we had more of them, but uh, you all know uh, how, uh, how it looks. So we began uh, to conceive some proof of concept for, uh, for our architecture. Uh, and the goal for, uh, for, um, that we had for this proof of concept was to have a full matchmaking flow for, uh, for our future games. So we wanted it to be um, lightweight, uh, customizable, and um, uh, since this was a f uh, proof of concept, we had some uh, we had to make some other assumptions, but I will get back to that in a moment. Uh, and the secondary goal was to, uh, to work on the game server orchestration. We wanted to, um, to have some, some solution tested that would allow us to, uh, to deploy the game server, to scale it, uh, to monitor how it's, how it's uh, functioning. So, um, so since we had uh, our intention was to test the matchmaking um, after the matchmaking we wanted the uh, our test client to have something to connect to uh, and we created some uh, some mock game server to uh, to work on that uh, so at this point uh, we had uh, we had to make some design decisions uh, that will allow us to to work on that proof of concept and uh, since this was a proof of concept. We wanted to test some, uh, some different approaches, different, uh, different services, different foundations. Uh, we wanted to be able to uh, iterate quickly on, on our prototypes. So uh, that, was, uh, that was one of the requirements. Uh, second being the ability to work independently. Uh, because uh, our uh, team that uh, created this, uh, this ar future architecture wasn't large. So, uh, so we had to split trans responsibilities and uh, to work independently on the different parts of, um, of the matchmaking loop, uh, of the services. So, uh, so we wanted to, to be able to do different things, not to step on each other's toes. So, uh, so that was uh, the other requirement. Um, also, since this was a POC, we wanted to, uh, to be able to set up everything easily. Uh, it would be best if you are able to run everything on our development machines. And because of that, we also wanted it to be performant, because some, uh, some solutions might, uh, might be too, too heavy for, uh, for, for development machines. And, uh, and we, wanted to, uh, we wanted to be able to, to work on that locally. Uh, 
And also for development, uh, we tried to, uh, to have the communication as open as possible. We wanted uh, everything to, um, to, be, uh, to be sent uh, uh, most likely in the, uh, in the plain text. And since some of us had uh, background in, in web applications, we just chose uh, HTTP with uh, REST API. That might be changed later, but it would allow us to um, to debug the, tra uh, the traffic between services easily, and also, um, and also there are a lot of different tools for telemetry, for tracking requests between services. So that allowed us to um, to be more efficient on uh, on the task. Uh, of course, uh, it uh, it was best to do to use uh, something that we already know. You know so not to learn everything from scratch. So, uh, so that was one of our choices that we wanted to have something known. Of course, we were open to new things, but, uh, um, uh, but thankfully we were able to find, uh, find some things that we had already experienced. In. So that was, uh, that was the uh, initial, um, initial structure of, uh, of our services. Uh, we reuse uh, the idea for, for the front controller, for the coordinator for, uh, for the, um, uh, as, as the point of contact between the game client and our, uh, our service mesh. And this coordinator would talk to the session assigner uh, that would uh, have the knowledge of uh, how many servers are uh, currently available, how, uh, of, and since it was, it was an experiment, we didn't know at this, this point if a single server would serve single session or, or multiple session. Hence, we called it a session assigner, not the server assigner. Um, at this point, we decided not to get into, into matchmaking that much, so, uh, so we just added some static code for, for matchmaking. So when, uh, whenever two clients uh, connected to, to the coordinator, they, 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 they had match, and they, they got the URL to the game server. And the thing that we already knew, but also um, proved very important uh, while working on, uh, on different, uh, different services um, uh, independently was to establish a, a contract, contract of, uh, of communication between, the ser between services, which was, uh, on, um, in our case, uh, the um, API. So, so we described the API as, uh, as well as possible, and uh, it allowed us to, to make uh, changes in the services uh, independently. So one person was working on some one part, the uh, other on some, some other part. And so if, uh, if we uh, held to the contract, everything, uh, everything was, was fine with the communication between, between the services. And uh, at this point, um, since uh, we wanted uh, we wanted the um, the services to be lightweight, uh, well, uh, the technology known to us, and also to be able to run that on our computers, uh, we were using um, using um, code implemented in Go Go language, and uh, we were just building it and running the bi binaries on on our machines and. Uh, some of us uh, were working on MacBooks, some on Windows. Uh, so the idea of uh, cross-compilation and compatibility between those platforms in Golang was, was very helpful. Uh, but we were also thinking about uh, future deployment of those services and running them, uh, running them over the internet. So we used the uh, technology that was also known to us before, uh, the containers. And uh, the containers, of course, are widely used in, in the web application community for years now. And uh, so, so that, was, uh, that was our obvious choice. And uh, uh, the containers uh, work kind of <laughs> uh, the same way on, uh, on development and production. Um, if you know what you are doing, uh, you can run the same containers on, uh, on the development and on production. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, um, that's also a thing that uh, helped us iterate, iterate quickly on, on our, um, on our uh, 
designs because uh, when we built something that was working locally, we just pushed it to to the registry in um, in our uh, in our uh, services, and uh, it was it was working without without any changes. So the deployment of Docker containers is is very easy, especially if you are using um, using the container uh, orchestration systems like um, for for Docker that we are using. Um, uh, there is of course obvious choice uh, of Kubernetes, and uh, deployment of uh, of those containers on Kubernetes was uh, was very easy. You just push push the container to the registry, update some YAML file which might be a problem because no, not everyone likes YAML files, uh, but uh, because of that we quickly moved to the uh, continuous integration uh, pipeline that did this for us. So we, commit, we, we did a commit with, uh, to, to our repository, tagged, this, uh, tagged uh, that with some version, and phew, magic happened and it was, it was working on our development cluster. And uh, yeah, like I said, there are, uh, there are multiple uh, major uh, or orchestration systems for, um, for Docker containers, so it was also, uh, also a, a plus for us. And those are widely supported in the cloud, which was also our, um, our target environment, because uh, at this point we didn't want to host that on any kind of dedicated servers, um, but I will get back to that uh, in a moment. And also for people with with the uh, web uh, web background, it was uh, it was a known technology. Okay, so so we had uh, we had few moving parts of uh, of the architecture. We had the uh, coordinator. We we had the session assigner, and um, this was uh, this was uh, a thing that allowed us to uh, to create. Uh, multiple lightweight agents that uh, connect that uh, to different environment uh, environments uh, that we experimented with. Uh, we we decided to so, some of them to uh, to scrap, some of them to uh, to move forward. But uh, uh, but since uh, in the uh, in the beginning uh, the session assigner just knew okay there is this game server it's hard coded okay you can assign that. Uh, but at some point we wanted to be able to. Um, the session assigner to get some information from some kind of database or something like that to, to know how many game servers there are, how many, how many of them are available. So, uh, so created um, uh, a connector to the Kubernetes API that just asked, okay, how many, how many servers do you have? What are the uh, IPs of those, of those servers? And inside uh, Kubernetes API, we also uh, had information about the occupancy, so so we were able to track if uh, if they are uh, available or not, uh, uh, if they are busy. So our updated uh, updated architecture looked like that. So we had the uh, the session assigner uh, at this point had uh, some hard coded list lists of uh, session assigner agents, and those uh, and. Uh, since uh, since we were able to um, uh, to put multiple session assigner agents, we we uh, we were able to put the uh, game server clusters in different parts of the world. So we had uh, so we had those uh, locally. We had those uh, in the somewhere in the cloud, and a session assigner decided, okay, I want to get server from local uh, local cluster and. Um, this, at this point, of course, it was an experiment, but later on uh, we could do some, some magic with that, but also I will get back to this later. Uh, so we had, uh, so we had the, um, we had the uh, matchmaking side of the, of, of the architecture, um, but uh, we also wanted to, uh, to be able to orchestrate the, uh, the game servers. And, uh, maybe a brief, uh, brief introduction to the game server world. Um, let's get back to the history. Uh, this is a very famous, uh, famous photo of a LAN party. Uh, this is in, uh, in someone's basement, uh, not too many computers, but uh, too many of them because one of the guys is strapped to the ceiling uh, to be able to play. So, um, uh, at, the, at this point, um, there weren't too many players, so uh, anyone uh, on, 
anyone in the in their local network, anyone, uh, any player, any of the players could become a game server, and that was fine. Uh, but LAN parties sometimes went wild, so uh, they got bigger, and uh, like as you can see here, um, they uh, they required they had some different uh, different requirements. So uh, of course they needed to have a venue to put everyone. Uh, everyone in uh, in a single single um, single uh, hall, uh, but also um, that's uh, that many players is a little bit too much to, for uh, for a single uh, player's PC to to handle. So um, at some point, uh, people uh, started to run dedicated game servers that were uh, that were uh, prepared especially to host uh, to host game for multiple players, and the game servers have some. Uh, specific requirements, specific features, and uh, I will talk a little bit about those features, but of course different games and different gameplays and different uh, design decisions um, have uh, um, influenced those um, in a different way, so it might uh, not, uh, th those features I will tell about might not be applicable to every game server. So. Um, in, uh, um, in many situations, uh, the game server is the uh, authoritative source of events. So uh, the game is not uh, the game client is not deciding um, about what's uh, what's happening in the game. They only uh, they only uh, send uh, send events to the game server. Game server does the calculations and sends the result. Uh, that puts a lot of strain to, uh, on the game server. But on the other hand, it also um, makes, uh, for instance, cheating uh, more difficult uh, because uh, because of uh, the uh, speed requirements. Uh, quite often, uh, the game state uh, is is held in in memory for uh, for the games. Uh, the game servers, like I said, is processing player input and sends the results to uh, to the uh, players. And the players have to have to be able to connect to some uh, to some IP and port over over the network. So uh, usually it needs to expose um, directly or uh, indirectly through some some routing the um, open port for for the communication. Uh, as for the session length, uh, so how long the uh, the session or even the whole game server uh, is is live, it depends on the gameplay because for uh, for some uh, for some fast-paced shooters, it's going to be um, it's going to be a few minutes. For some MMORPGs, it's going to be uh, hours, days, weeks. Who knows how long? Uh, so uh, so it might be difficult, very difficult to host uh, to host um, that uh, that kind of games. It uh, it re requires a very meticulous tracking of memory usage and and so on. And for many games, um, latency is very important. So to provide the best uh, experience for uh, for the players, uh, the latency should be uh, as low as possible, uh, because otherwise uh, the game would feel laggy. And for also for some games, the game server might be very heavy because of all the assets it's it's keeping, and that's provide that's. Um, that's um, that also li that's also limiting some uh, some options to orchestrate to deploy the servers and uh, uh, there are some techniques that uh, makes uh, makes the deployment of the heavy game servers um, easier. Uh, it's uh, the pre warming because, for instance, if you have um, uh, if you don't have enough of uh, of the game servers and you have to s uh, spin up more, uh, if um, um, if the server uh, server is booting up for like 10 minutes, you know that it's it's uh, if you are spinning up new servers uh, when there are not enough of them, it's it's too late. You have to do it earlier uh, to to allow the game server to um, to spin up and uh, start pre warming of of the empty sessions and. Um, also, uh, to alleviate that that issue, sometimes the uh, game servers, instead of restarting completely, they are just wiping the session and um, and uh, providing a clean clean world, clean battlefield for uh, for the players. And how the game servers were hosted, uh, are hosted, were hosted. Um, the traditional approach was the uh, bare metal. It's like dedicated servers or uh, hardware or, or even sometimes um, virtual machines that were hosted by, by yourself. 
And um, this is a traditional approach that was uh, very popular. It is, it is still quite popular, but um, because uh, uh, the cloud um, was, uh, uh, was too mysterious in, in the way of its working, uh, the game servers had higher requirements and uh, putting them on virtual machines sometimes was, was not an option. And uh, if you have your online game, uh, usually it's not that you have a constant number of players. You have to think about scaling, uh, scaling your, your game uh, to, to handle all the, uh, all the traffic that you might have. So two traditional, uh, traditional approaches, horizontal and vertical scaling, scaling up, meaning that you, uh, you are adding more, uh, more memory, more hard drives, more CPUs to a single, uh, to a single PC, or scaling out uh, if, you are, uh, if your architecture allows you to, uh, to add new, new machines and put, uh, put the game servers on them. And downsides of, uh, of having that on your bare metal. Uh, low flexibility, meaning that it takes time to uh, order new hardware and uh, to install that. And if, uh, even if you are um, renting out the, um, the machines from, from some ISP, it, sometimes it's still uh, up to the ISP to provide the hardware, so, so it might take some time. And also, uh, on the other hand, you, when, you, when you are preparing uh, the number of game servers, we are prepar preparing for the peak. So, um, so you can handle the, ga the game at its uh, peak traffic, but you, still, you are still with the hardware if, uh, if the usage is like 10% of the peak or 5%. So you have a lot of unused processing power. Um, and it's a long-term commitment. Uh, usually, if you want to get the best price from the ISP, you decide that, OK, I'm going to be using that for, for a year, for instance. Um, and if you, if you are buying uh, hardware, you, you are just stuck with that. Uh, so like the, you, uh, like, uh, like the venue for the LAN party, when you, when you bought a huge, uh, huge building for the LAN party, um, it's, uh, it's quite impractical because uh, you are not using that all the time. And the same with servers. You, uh, it would be awesome to have, uh, to have an option to, to scale the, the servers. So with the venue, you can just rent out a smaller one, the one that you, that you might um, need at this point. And with the servers, is, uh, it is possible for it to, to be the same with the cloud. I know that uh, the cloud is the thing that, uh, uh, that is a buzzword for like 15 years now or something like that. Um, so, uh, so I'll try not to not to bore you with uh, with the very detailed introduction. But uh, let's let's jump through some bullet points. So the cloud is uh, isn't uh, like some cloud, like uh, very uh, like the cloud of processing power that you are using. It's just someone else's computer, and. Uh, with, uh, with someone else at this computer, uh, the providers are usually uh, installing some kind of virtual machines that you, that you rent out. So you rent a processing power on someone's hardware. And there are a few different tiers of, uh, of those services. Uh, so the uh, baseline is the infrastructure as a service. When you um, just uh, rent a virtual machine that you have to install the operating system on it and so on. Uh, platform as a service when you deploy uh, application to uh, to a virtual machine, but uh, managed by uh, by the vendor. Software as a service is uh, when you uh, when you gain access to uh, to a software that you um, that you want to use. And the uh, the most ephemeric one being the function as a service when you put some code uh, that is being run on. Um, on the machines, and you are paying only for, for the time that this function is being run. So the function has some input, returns some output, and you pay only for this processing uh, time. So pros and cons. Um, uh, of course, the flexibility, because you don't have to, uh, you don't have to um, rent the, uh, the cloud machines for, for a year. You can, you can have that for an hour for the peak traffic and, and destroy the machine when, when it's not necessary. But of course, with, um, uh, with the flexibility comes, comes some price because, uh, uh, of course, the uh, cloud vendors have to have this hardware waiting for you to, to use it, and, uh, uh, and they, they have to compensate for, 
um, for, uh, for the unused time. So it is more expensive than the um, dedicated hardware, but uh, you, can, you can do the calculations when, when it's um, cost effective and when it's not. Um, the technology that the cloud, um, cloud machines are run on have, uh, have some, let's say, issues or features. Uh, the most obnoxious one is the noise neighbor because uh, virtual machines should uh, separate the um, uh, should separate uh, should be sep completely separated um, at the hardware. But uh, it's not perfect, and sometimes uh, when you have some uh, have uh, there is some other cu other customer of this uh, of this cloud operator have has some virtual machine on the same. Uh, physical hardware as your as yours, and uh, then there can be some interfer interference, especially when uh, when the other VM is uh, using the input output input output heavily, um, the um, hard drive network and so on. So it might cause some issues because we had uh, we had experience that uh, our our applications were behaving very erratic and we didn't know why, and we just uh, shut down the. Mm, the machine sp spun up a new one, and it was working perfectly. So, uh, so those things uh, those things happen. And uh, virtual machines um, is the abstract layer between hardware and software. So, so there is also um, a problem with uh, input output sometimes, uh, not too often, but uh, you have to take that into account. Um, and you can, uh, there is an option to put some device pass through to, to the virtual machine. So uh, your machine is uh, is using uh, using some hardware exclusively. And for some uh, for some VMs, uh, you have to also check the features of the storage because sometimes, especially for for some uh, for some less expensive tiers, uh, the storage is uh, is kept on some other machine and is exported over the network and it, this might also provide some some issues and the cloud operators who work on some tech stack and they are um, they are limiting number of uh, environments that you might use uh, programming languages uh, the platform as a service is being um, is um, offered for for some programming languages and the same it is with uh, function as a service and if you are using some vendor-specific um, uh, vendor-specific features of um, of the VMs of, of the environment, you have to uh, you have to know that you are locked in that environment possibly for for some time. It's not always a problem, but it's something that uh, you you have to be aware of. Uh, so. Uh, we were testing running the uh, running our whole environment in in the cloud. So, uh, at, uh, in the beginning, we hosted the Kubernetes cluster on our machines. But after some time, we wanted to um, to test that in in the wild in the in the cloud. So, um, so we put everything in the cloud. We had the Kubernetes cluster for uh, for our services. Um, we had one for for our mock servers. And um, since we were using the generic uh, Kubernetes, nothing, uh, nothing very specific, it worked perfectly. It, uh, w we, um, we did that with, uh, uh, with all the main, um, main cloud vendors. So we deployed everything uh, on AWS, on GCP, on Azure. So, uh, so it was working without, without any issues. And, um, since uh, it was uh, a time for experiments and we, we had some time, we had everything working in all the, uh, all the clouds, so we were thinking, okay, let's try going multi-cloud. So, so we tested if it's possible, if it's feasible and uh, cost-effective to, to have uh, our environment working in, um, in, different, uh, in different cloud vendors at the same time. But, uh, why even the idea? Why we would want to, to have our services working in um, uh, on different vendors' environment? First of all, uh, the latency. We uh, we were trying to prepare everything to be uh, as fast as possible for for our players, and uh, we were thinking about putting our game servers as close as close geographically to to, to the players, and. Um, 
different cloud vendors have their data centers in different places. So, um, so we wanted to to be um, to have the possibility of of putting everything in in different places um, and offer and uh, ma and make the game sessions uh, as uh, um, as fast as uh, as fast as, as possible. Uh, the other issue issues, uh, issue was uh, was the price because uh, different vendors have different prices and uh, they have different prices for different data centers. So uh, we wanted to be able to uh, to say, okay, Mr. Session Assigner, please check uh, what's the latency between the uh, the player and this data center and how expensive it is uh, for, for to host that session. And um, if it, uh, and also make that calculation to uh, to the uh, data center that is with maybe a little bit um, longer pings, but uh, but much less expensive. So um, so we wanted to be able to make some calculations with weights. Um, if uh, uh, if we are interested in paying much more for um, a little bit better um, better latency. Uh, also, uh, the issue of availability, because um, on paper it's, uh, it, it sounds great. Uh, you just click and you get machines in, uh, in some part of the world. Uh, but sometimes this is not the case, especially if you want to have some uh, thousand new VMs because you are preparing for, for some peak traffic, for a new event, new release, or stuff like that. Um, you might stumble upon the issue that um, this given data center just doesn't have those uh, those uh, virtual CPUs uh, ready to be used, so we have to rely on some other cloud vendors. So, uh, so that was also the issue um, that we took into consideration, and um, the issue of uh, let's say uh, regions without the standard pre presence, uh, meaning that. There are some regions in the world when normal cloud operators are not allowed to uh, to operate, and we knew that we might have uh, uh, a need to to connect uh, connect to them separately, uh, maybe treat them as a different region, uh, isolated from from other players. So uh, that was also one of our concerns. Uh, but those were uh, th those were the things why you might go uh, multi-cloud, but uh, why not? Um, because, for instance, the uh, external traffic prices. Uh, so that's uh, one of the things that um, that you have to take into consideration: that uh, the traffic outside of the uh, given cloud operator might be uh, a lot more expensive than. Uh, than inside uh, inside um, the internal network of uh, of given operator, so uh, so that's um, one of the problems. Uh, second would be the security because uh, the traffic between your services is being uh, is being routed outside of the internal network. So uh, you have to you have to make sure that your um, that your security is uh, is tight is. Um, uh, if you if you allow allow for external connection, and I think the most uh, most important problem with with multi cloud is the diverse uh, ecosystem, meaning that uh, it's uh, uh, even if you are using some generic uh, generic services, um, those services might might have some different quirks that uh, work in a different way in different operators. Uh, you have to you have to have experts uh, in uh, uh, even in uh, clicking uh, clicking through the panels of of the operators. Different uh, if you are using some infrastructure as a service uh, infrastructure as a code. Sorry, if you are using infrastructure as a code, you have to have separate scripts for for those different operators. So in general, you have to you have to get a PhD in the free. Uh, for instance, um, the technologies instead of one. So, uh, so that uh, that's a thing to consider. And uh, for instance, um, the Spotify, uh, because of that, uh, decided to go um, to go strictly single cloud. It allowed them to um, to reduce uh, complexity, a lot of issues, a lot of problems. So, uh, so that's 
that's a choice you have to make, uh, but that's a thing you, you might consider as an option. Okay, so um, we, had, uh, we had the um, generic service uh, of Kubernetes, we had the agents, um, we had uh, the idea of going multi-cloud, so we deployed, uh, we deployed our code to the multiple, um, multiple cloud operators. Uh, with the um, with the Kubernetes agents and and it worked perfectly, uh, kind of to our surprise <laughs> because uh, usually in uh, in different ecosystems uh, something uh, goes wrong, but uh, it was working fine without any issues. Um, but that was um, that was the generic Kubernetes service. And uh, at some point, uh, the cloud operators noticed that uh, hey, there is game dev they might have some needs and we might provide them with some offers, special services dedicated to the, uh, to, uh, to the game dev. And, um, and there are some offers that um, expose some APIs um, for uh, game server scaling. And since we, um, we, had some, uh, we had the option to experiment, we created uh, we created some uh, additional uh, agents dedicated uh, strictly to uh, to those uh, to those services. So, um, so we had the option to go to go Kubernetes, um, to go to some cloud uh, cloud vendor special offers like uh, uh, the AWS has uh, has some offer for for orchestration. Uh, Azure has something. So, uh, so we created the connectors to those um, to those services. And uh, uh, again, session assigner uh, could could decide if uh, if you want to um, get uh, get a game server uh, spun up uh, in uh, in a, as a generic uh, virtual machine hosting uh, Kubernetes with Docker and so on, or some dedicated service, and it also worked fine. Uh, but those uh, those um, vendor specific offers is a different topic and uh, it deserves a, a separate session. But also we said, okay, we have already a hybrid solution. We can try something interesting uh, to have uh, uh, to have that um, to get back to the bare metal because bare metal was is the generally the, the um, it's the least flexible, but uh, it's best uh, as being uh, cost effective. So, uh, so we had the idea of uh, of creating the agent for bare metal, and ta da! <laughs> we created another another small part that connected to um, to our bare metal servers. Of course, it's the simplest one because it just uh, it just kept uh, kept a list of servers that we have and uh, assigned them, uh, keeping some internal database. Um, but this, uh, it was it was fun that we had uh, we had this those tiny components uh, like uh, I think it was like 1,000 lines of code, uh, very lightweight, very fast, and we just uh, decided okay, let's hook to, to this API and now to this API and uh, and created a whole bunch of them, replaced them, tested, experimented. Uh, we had some stress test, uh, um, scaling tests, uh, so. Uh, so uh, having those uh, small uh, small parts that uh, um, that we were able to uh, iterate over them quickly um, was uh, was a perfect solution uh, for the POC phase. But in the end, it it appeared that uh, those are uh, those components are very performant um, and also very stable. So um, so we thought, okay, that's. Uh, that's not only a proof of concept, but also some uh, some foundation for for the production-worthy services. So, the experimentation phase was uh, was very fruitful, and uh, kind of uh, simultaneously, we were also thinking about how to approach the matchmaking because we had some uh, we had some. Uh, design requirements that we that we um, that we described uh, because those experiments were um, were pre preparing our our architecture our components for the next years 
we didn't know what kind of games we would have to uh, uh, deal with, so um, so we had some uh, some ideas uh, how it might look like. But on the other hand, we had to uh, we had to make sure that those are flexible enough, pluggable, uh, and replaceable. And um, based on our experience with, with Gwent, we wanted to provide the players with the best experience. So we wanted to uh, we wanted our um, our matchmaker to be able to provide the um, best match, basing on uh, on the match quality, um, basing on different different um, different features. Like for instance, um, the um, Matchmaker could look at uh, at the level of uh, of the players and match um, match the players with kind of similar level. And uh, in some other games, if we went with some uh, some game that might had some quests, we might match uh, players that didn't do similar quests. So we can put them uh, into a single game and uh, give them a, a fun time uh, with with some some new quests. Uh, and also to know that uh, they, the, the match is, is good, we wanted, uh, it was very important to us to have, uh, to keep the telemetry on, uh, on each level of, uh, of the matchmaking. So we wanted to to know that what kind of players are matched, uh, how long it takes to find a match, uh, how many players we have in the matchmaking. So we wanted to think about that at the uh, initial, initial conception phase. Uh, also, uh, of course, uh, we we wanted it to be um, to be ver uh, to be uh, scalable, uh, and. Uh, uh, trans uh, resilient in a transparent way, meaning that um, there is, uh, uh, it's uh, quite often that uh, one of the players that were already matched uh, just quits. So uh, with that situation, we wanted to put the player back into matchmaking pool without the, the player noticing that. So, so we didn't, he didn't have to um, click back through the through the matchmaking uh, to see, even to see that uh, the other play, player has disconnected. So. Uh, so we wanted that to be handled transparently, and also um, we we already knew that we would have to um, we would have to um, make our matchmaking um, work in regions uh, because of many different um, um, different um, things. Uh, for instance, there is the issue of uh, transferring data from. Uh, European Union outside European Union. So that's a uh, low requirement that at some point might uh, limit uh, the matchmaking only to the uh, EU and outside EU. So that's uh, that's a thing that we had to consider and um, we had to pre prepare our matchmaking for that. So, um, so we created um, another small component uh, that we called Searcher. Uh, it had some kind of uh, matchmaking request database. And um, the searcher uh, pulled uh, some pool of uh, matchmaking request. Okay, from the beginning, the coordinator when when the player uh, connected and uh, wanted to have uh, a match, the coordinator sent the request to the searcher. And at first, the searcher puts that request to the database. So in the database, we have, uh, uh, let's say, our game is very popular. So we have thousands of players in the matchmaking pool at given moment. And the searcher pulls, uh, pulls uh, for instance, some, some batch of those players, like 100, checks if, uh, uh, finds be best matches in that pool, and uh, for those matches, it returns to the coordinator um, match players, and returns, uh, returns the rest to, to the database with the notice that those players will, were already in, uh, in the matchmaking process. And um, uh, for those, we could uh, we could uh, do some uh, some another loop uh, of the of the matchmaking with a little bit loosened requirements because um, our idea was that uh, some match is better than no match. So uh, we want it to be best, but on the other hand, um, it's better to provide provide the player with with something. And since we wanted the um, we wanted the process to be scalable. We, 
could just add more searchers uh, working. So uh, when we know, uh, if, we, if we would notice that uh, the matchmaking is taking um, too much time or there is the too big pool of players in the database, we can spin up more searches to, um, to do the uh, matchmaking process concurrently. And uh, we even um, had, uh, had that automated, so, uh, so the searcher exposed some metric, and basing on that metric, the Kubernetes just scaled those, uh, uh, those containers automatically. So that was, um, that was the uh, final, uh, final idea that we had with, uh, with the matchmaking. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, we created uh, tons of, of, uh, of components uh, that uh, talked uh, to each other uh, at the development um, stage, uh, um, uh, stage uh, um, in, uh, in um, HTTP. Uh, with the target uh, being uh, gRPC. Uh, we had those working in the cloud, uh, scaling automatically for, um, for the game server scaling uh, on, on Kubernetes. Uh, at some point, uh, we noticed that um, the uh, generic scaling that's, uh, that's being offered by, by Kubernetes is not enough, so we used uh, uh, a special plugin designed specifically for game servers called Agones. Uh, right now, it's um, uh, right now it's controlled by uh, it's run by Google, uh, but it's open source solution and it's generic enough to work on work in any uh, in, uh, Kubernetes environment. And um, like you saw uh, in that uh, architecture before, we use uh, we used uh, Agones in um, in all the main clouds. So, a uh, few takeaways from, from my presentation, as this, this was the final form of the, of the architecture. Uh, lightweight components uh, make the iteration fast. So, we, uh, we were able to pre pre prepare some, uh, some new versions, uh, completely rebuild them uh, very quickly. It was, uh, it was a very fun process, uh, like um, a little bit uh, chaotic on, uh, some, uh, sometimes, but we had the uh, contract of communication between the components, so, um, so we knew that um, if the communication, uh, if both sides know how to talk to each other, it will be fine. And um, we, had, we had our, um, our development cluster that, uh, that had the components deployed automatically by our uh, CI pipeline. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes you saw that the versions are changing in the matter of minutes because uh, someone had some new idea, some new fix, uh, some new version, and uh, we were able to, to work in the independently on them. Uh, like I said, work on the API contract because it's uh, very important for, for uh, for the whole team to, to know how to, how to communicate um, between the services. And that's especially important if you have different teams working on different components. So they have to have some common ground uh, to, to, work, um, to work on the, uh, on the services and uh, for the services to, to work as a, as a whole. Uh, we chose uh, Golang, um, but uh, because we had some experience with that. Um, but uh, low-level languages um, are sometimes um, difficult to handle, uh, especially if uh, uh, if, a dev if some developer uh, didn't have experience with them. They have uh, they have issues. Um, Golang, for instance, was uh, designed as. Uh, as simple as possible without any syntactic sugar, uh, but uh, this made the language to be um, known for, um, very, uh, for being very difficult to achieve some simple things if you don't know, uh, if you don't know a pattern for that. So um, it's, it's obvious when you saw that in some other person's code, but uh, if, you, if you want to devise that by yourself, it might be, it might be difficult. Um, the cloud as, uh, uh, as a deployment environment uh, can remove uh, 
can take a lot of burden from you. So you don't have to take care of, uh, of virtual machines, uh, of operating system, uh, setting up networking. Um, I mean, at the development stage, because uh, uh, it's it's good to have uh, to have uh, on your team someone who who knows how to set up everything. Uh, Securely, especially, uh, so so you do not expose uh, more that uh, that you would like to. Uh, but also, uh, it makes uh, uh, it makes it easier uh, to uh, to host everything. Um, Kubernetes as an orchestration um, as an orchestration uh, system. Uh, gives you scaling out of the box, uh, deployment. So, as a basis for um, for your for your cloud um, cloud operation, it uh, um, it gives you um, opportunity to to start quickly. Start with your prototypes. Uh, start with uh, with some um, proof of concept or uh, MVP. So, uh, so that's that's great for uh, for start. Um, like I said, uh, sometimes uh, the single cloud operator is not enough if you have very specific requirements. Um, but on the other hand, it might um, it might be uh, too difficult to handle, too expensive. Um, so uh, so think well about uh, about implementing that pattern. Um, we used uh, Kubernetes and as a generic service, and it was very helpful for us um, because we we were not bound uh, to a single uh, single vendor, single operator, and uh, having generic services, um, if if that was if it's possible, uh, I would recommend that. Um, also, um, especially for the cloud, check for hidden costs, like uh, like I said with the external traffic. And uh, not only that, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not by accident that uh, the cloud operators have some uh, cost calculators on the, on fund sites because it's too difficult for uh, for people to understand um, the pricing on uh, on the vendor pages. So uh, usually, for instance, if you uh, if you want to set up a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, there is the cost of the cost of the cloud, uh, cost of the virtual machines, cost of the um, some uh, some networking, some um, Kubernetes, some backplane. So there's a lot of that, and it can be uh, well hidden. Uh, and if it's possible, avoid increased complexity. And that's what it. Thank you very much for uh, for listening. Of course, we are hiring, uh, and so if you are interested, you can go to our website, and um, and we are uh, always looking for talented um, engineers, artists, uh, and um, people of many different crafts. Thank you very much. We have four minutes. Are there any questions? Hello, thanks for good talk. So my question is, you said you are using REST API, or you were using mm -hmm. HTTP-based communication, and I thought it was kind of strange if you want to have low latency and use HTTP on the backend, but uh, through the presentation, I get a feeling that it is mostly because, uh, because it is used on the management uh, connection or for the management instead of the real game. Is it correct? Um, uh, in, in the, during the development, we uh, we decided to go with H, uh, with bare H, 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 HTTP because uh, it's very easy to debug. Uh, because uh, when we dumped the network traffic, we saw the requests, saw the responses, and it was very obvious to the developer what's happening. And if we, if, uh, we wanted to go with uh, gRPC, with uh, in, uh, production environment, and uh, gRPC is uh, binary encoded, so we would need um, some extra development tools to, to see what's actually happening. And also, um, for HTTP, uh, we, had, uh, we already had some uh, some request tracking uh, uh, middleware to, to see 
exactly what services are com communicating with each other. Uh, we were using Jaeger uh, at that point. Uh, later on, we moved to, uh, to some uh, vendor-specific uh, tools, but uh, during the development, it was, uh, it was much, much easier for us to, to work on that. But uh, um, like you said, uh, we can have a totally different uh, traffic between, uh, between the game client and the front manager and internally. So, um, so we um, so we can have uh, we can have uh, different protocols uh, in different places. Okay, thank you. We have one minute, so if you want to have some uh, some questions uh, later on, I will be just hanging around. So, I, uh, thanks for the uh, nice talk. So, I would like to ask, like, you are working with multi-cloud and uh, most of the major vendors. So, do you have the all the development team in-house or you are also outsourcing something to other companies, uh, like taking care of, you know, managing the cloud environment for you? Uh, right now, we have, uh, we have uh, everything internally, but... Uh, with, uh, with some specific things, I have to uh, thank uh, to the cloud operators because they are helping us uh, uh, heavily with, uh, with some tweaks and uh, they are very really helpful with providing some technical feedback. And uh, so right now we are not, uh, we are not using any outsourcing. Um, it, it was uh, development, um, development work and uh, also um, we wanted to keep some secrecy of some projects, so uh, hence we held, we held everything internally. Thank you very much.